Hey guys, how you doing? My name is John, Games81, and welcome back to another episode. Today we're going to take a closer look at what I personally believe is one of the most underrated retro systems you'll find, and that is the Sega Saturn. So let's take a closer look at the system itself, let's show you some gameplay, talk about the history, thanks for watching. In front of me I have two versions of the Saturn. I have to my left the Victor Saturn released by JBC in Japan, and to my right I have the Sega Saturn released in North America. I'll explain to you why there's different companies and why they look a little bit different later on in the video, but before I do that, I want to dive into the history of the system itself. And in order to do so, let's start in January of 1994. At the time, CEO of Sega, Hayao Nakayama, announced to the world that Sega was going to release a new 32-bit console. And this was big news because they realized that 16-bit market was pretty much dying. There were 32-bit consoles already in the market. You had the 3DO, for example. But this was big news to hear that Sega was going to be developing this. What Mr. Nakayama did was he had Sega of Japan work on a project called Project Jupiter, which eventually turned into the Saturn. And he had, he had Sega of America work on a Project Mars, which would eventually turn into the Sega 32X. So essentially one hand did not know what the other one was doing. They weren't really working together. In fact, in, in North America, Tom Kalinske at the time announced that they were going to be releasing to the world the Sega Saturn in September 2nd, 1995. They actually called it Saturn Day because it was on a Saturday. Um, so that was interesting, but here's what backfired. And this is kind of where things got messy for Sega. They heard that Sony was going to be releasing the PlayStation 1 in September during around the same time. So Sega kind of more or less freaked out, in my opinion, and they decided to move the release date five months earlier to May 11th, 1995. And was this a good idea? No. It actually ended up backfiring for Sega because a lot of the developers, third-party developers for the Saturn, were very, very pissed because they were expecting to be releasing games in September and not May, and that five months makes a huge difference. So they felt that their toes were stepped on, they felt there was very little communication between Sega and the third-party developers. In fact, not only were the developers pissed, but a lot of the retailers retailers were pissed as well. Walmart, KB Toys, Toys R Us were all pissed. In fact, KB, KB Toys actually boycotted Sega, and they got rid of all the Sega games, all the Sega Saturns, didn't sell Sega. And unfortunately, that stuck with Sega for a while, up into through the Dreamcast as well, because EA never developed any Dreamcast games because of what happened with the Saturn. So that was a huge mistake. The Saturn was retail for 399 US dollars when it was released. Now, in comparison, the PlayStation 1, when that was released by Sony five months later, that retailed for $299. So it was $100 less to buy the PlayStation 1 than it was to buy the Saturn. The Saturn was a very powerful system for back in the day. It had two CPUs. It also had six processors as well. But because of that, and because of the two CPUs, it made it very difficult to program for the games. So a lot of developers had to actually program from, from square one rather than having... Uh, like the N64 and PlayStation 1, they actually it was much easier to develop for those two systems compared to the Saturn. Um, that was a huge another issue that they had with third-party support for the Saturn. Let's take a cl closer look at the system itself. It's actually a pretty heavy system. Very well built. You got your, your reset button here. You got your open. The game in here is, let's see, Street Fighter, the movie. This is a game based on the movie, which is based on the game. I know it's confusing, but that sounds about as good as it is. <laughs> Trust me on that. Not a very good game. This is a power button right here. This is your uh, light that lights up when it's on. This is your two controller ports here. This is a cartridge slot. No, it does not play any cartridge games. I'll explain to you why, what that is in a moment. On the back, you have your AC adapter. You have your AV out. This is what they call a communication connector. They had a thing called the Direct Link, which is available for eight games, which you can actually connect to another system uh, with two, an, another TV, and you can play multiplayer with that, kind of local multiplayer. On the back here, this this compartment actually opens up, and you actually can slip in um, a card in here, which will allow you to play VCDs, which are basically video CDs. This is before DVD really took place, so you can actually play movies and stuff on the Saturn. It plays not only games, but also plays CDs and CDGs and CDEGs. That's pretty neat. And that's pretty much it on the bottom. You just got some vents here. Uh, you know, all that good stuff here. So, let's, now let's compare this with the Victor Saturn. You're wondering why what was it called Victor? Why did JVC have the rights to make a Saturn? Well, Sega actually in Japan allowed both Hitachi and JVC to make the license out the Saturn because JVC helped with the CD-ROM and Hitachi helped with, I think, the CPU, CPUs, I believe. So, this is an example of one example of what you could do with a cartridge slot. This is a four megabyte cartridge expander, so you can basically play different games as Capcom made this. So there's games on the system like 
uh, X-Men versus Street Fighter. They could play it. You needed the, the memory expander in order to play it. There's also cartridges that would allow you to save games onto it. Uh, similar to a PlayStation 1 card where you can actually move it to different systems. Same kind of idea. Uh, but there's a built-in in-store memory as well. It's kind of similar to the 3DO. Okay, so there's also a thing called the Netlink, which I'm going to do a quick shout out. Check out Jerry Terrifying's channel. I'll put a link below. He's a big fan of the Saturn and he has a couple videos on the Netlink and, and the Saturn itself if you, if you want to see more. Uh, link is below. But what the Netlink would do is a modem that you would actually plug in the top and it would allow you to actually plug into your uh, like cable, your phone line, and you could play online. So similar, similar to Xbox Live and PSN today, you actually could play online. There's only about five games that you could actually play online with. There was Daytona USA, which was a very special limited edition version. There was Sega Rally, Duke Nukem 3D, uh, Saturn Bomberman, and the last one was Virtual On. So only five games would allow you to do that, but that's pretty cool. This is basically the same design as the one I just showed you. This is a region locked system. But you can also get another, another cartridge that would actually enable you to play region-free games. So you can play any game all, all around the world using that cartridge, which is pretty neat. Let's check out some of the controllers. Here's the most common controller you can find for the Saturn. This is a uh, six-button controller. you got the two bumper buttons as well. Uh, now, the first versions of the controllers were uh, much bigger, and they actually slimmed it down in the version 2. There's also a controller called the 3D controller, which kind of looks, handles very similar to a Dreamcast controller. It's a little more round, and it came with games like Night Into Dreams, where it was a 3D game, it was made, it had an analog stick, it was really cool. I don't own Nights Into Dreams, but I know it's one of the better games for the system. I plan on getting it very soon. I'm very excited about it, okay? But so there are three different controllers for it. This is the most common one. Very similar to the Genesis, or a Mega Drive controller. Here's a Victor controller, same thing. You just got the color, almost like candy buttons here. And these are interchangeable. You can play these, this controller on the Saturn and vice versa. There are a lot more games avail available for the Japanese Saturn there, than there is for the North American or European Saturn. By 1997, only a couple of years after the release of the Saturn in North America, Sega decided to, to discontinue the Saturn and focus on the Dreamcast, what they called Project Aurora. At the time uh, so they basically by that time people were given up on the Saturn the last game developed for the Saturn actually was released in 2000 so the system was a lot more successful in Japan than it was in North America or in Europe I'm gonna show you some games that I recommend for the Saturn I have Duke Nukem 3d which is an awesome one this has got an exclusive level if you like Duke 3d definitely check this out I'm really excited for the new Duke Nukem coming out by the way also if you like the Sega arcade games are a number of great ports for the Saturn. You got Virtual Racing, you have Virtual Fighter 2, you got uh, Daytona USA. Great ports, arcade ports available for the Saturn. So these cartridges, or these uh, cases rather, are more like Sega CD cases in North America. In Japan, you had more of this along the lines of these kind of games. These were CD, a more compact CD cases. This is X Men vs. Street Fighter. I felt it kind of appropriate to show you some gameplay for this one since Marvel vs. Capcom 3 is coming out soon as of recording this video. Now, finally, you're wondering yourself was it worth it? Was, did Sega make the right decision in releasing the Saturn five months before uh, the PlayStation 1? And the answer is no. Uh, by the time September hit and this PlayStation 1 was released, Saturn had only sold 80,000 systems in North America. Where, in, to put that in perspective, Sony, the first weekend, sold 100,000 systems. So, Sega, unfortunately, was third fiddle behind Sony and N64. Uh, so, it didn't really see the light. It didn't really last very long in North America. I do think it's a very underrated, underrated system, to be honest with you. If you're a retro collector, if you like want to get more into retro gaming, this is a great system to check out. There's some fantastic games. Uh, Nights into Dreams is one of them. Uh, I've played, I just don't own. Fun game. Panzer Dragoon is one of the rarest games for the system. It's a really fun RPG as well. All said and done, Sega had only sold 10 million consoles in the five plus years that it was on the market. And Sega actually ended up losing $268 million because of the Saturn. So it wasn't necessarily that the system was bad in itself. It was, it had some, there's some great potential for the system. There's some great gems for games for this. However, it was mainly the bad management decisions for Sega and them stepping on the toes of the developers and the distributors for the Saturn. Let's check out some gameplay for X-Men vs. Street Fighter. X-Men vs. Street Fighter was an arcade release in 1996. It was ported to the Sega Saturn in 1997 and the PlayStation 1 in 1998. 
This game has 16 playable characters, 8 are from the Street Fighter universe, and 8 are from the X-Men universe. This is the third Marvel game that Capcom had created, and this game actually predates Marvel vs. Capcom 1 by two years. This is the first game to take the tag team style element of fighting and blend it with the Street Fighter gameplay. There are three new Marvel characters introduced into this game that were not on the previous two Marvel game fighting games. You have Rogue, who I'm fighting right now, Gambit, and Sabretooth. X-Men vs. Street Fighter was also ported to the Sony PlayStation 1 in 1998. However, it's considered an inferior port compared to the Sega Saturn version due to the memory limitations of the PlayStation 1. The PlayStation 1 port is missing a lot of frames, but probably the most notable difference is the, that they don't have a tag feature in the PlayStation 1 port. And because of the missing frames and the, the no tag team in the PlayStation 1 port, the IGN actually only gave it a 6 out of 10, whereas the Saturn version got a little bit higher, 7.4 out of 10. Another difference between the PlayStation 1 version and the Sega Saturn version is the controller. Uh, this game plays much better on the Saturn 6 button controller than it does on your PlayStation 1 controller. And even though this game was never released in North America, this game is definitely worth checking out and downloading either through ROM form or picking up a, a Japanese Saturn just to check this out. If you are familiar with the Street Fighter Alpha series, you'll notice that all the Street Fighter characters have taken their alpha form from those games. Although they've enhanced the special moves, they made them larger to kind of match the larger than life Marvel atmosphere while you're fighting. In the bottom, you'll notice these level gauges is very similar to what that was introduced in Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo with the Super Combo Gauge. The players can perform a counterattack move, which will take away one level as they do that, or they can use two levels and do a variable combo with two players. The variable combo, or also known as hybrid combo, will use two levels, but it, it also will switch characters as long as neither of them get hit during the hybrid combo setting. Overall, this is a great blend of X-Men, great blend of Street Fighter. I really highly recommend checking this game out if you enjoy fighters. Thanks for watching, guys. Appreciate it. We'll see you soon. Take care.